And now I want to turn to the adjudication of the generic status of a mark. And so just as a practice point, if the mark is not registered, the burden is on the plaintiff to establish that their mark is not generic, if there's, an, if there's some kind of issue in that regard. However, if the mark is registered, registration is prima facie evidence of validity. And so this reflects one of the advantages of getting a trademark registration, even though registration is not required for protection. Now, if the defendant is claiming genericide, if we have a mark that was previously valid for one reason or another, then the defendant would have the burden of showing that the mark is generic. It's the primary significance of the mark in the minds of the relevant consuming public. We ask, does the trademark answer the question, who are you? Or does it answer the question, what are you? Sometimes you'll see courts referring to the who are you, what are you test. And so what can we look to for evidence? Well, you know, kinds of the things that you would imagine. You look to general usage, things like dictionaries, press reports, how, how, you know, how the term is used um, by, by, by the public. And then, of course, you can also come up with a survey. And then we have this added issue of how exactly do we evaluate trademark surveys. And in addition, as we have the problem that I adverted to before of the anti-dissection principle, how do we handle a situation when we combine generic terms and how do we determine whether or not the, that combination results in something that has a trademark meaning or something that still remains generic? And so the problem of surveys and anti-dissection principles both come up in the Booking.com case decided by the Supreme Court in 2020. And so in Booking.com, the PTO rejects Booking.com for a trademark registration concluding that it is a generic term. The applicant goes to district court and brings with it some new survey evidence purporting to show that the consuming public recognizes Booking.com as a descriptive mark that has acquired secondary meaning. And the district court buys this, and the Fourth Circuit upholds this conclusion. The case goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court affirms. And so of relevance for our purposes, the Supreme Court says that, first of all, the PTO has this basic presumption against trademarks that are styled as a generic word plus a top-level domain name like .com. So in other words, generic .com should not be presumed generic. And this is so, notwithstanding the fact that we have this earlier Supreme Court precedent that says when you put a generic term like company or incorporated together with another generic term, that does not produce a word with trademark significance. And the court says, well, things are different. First of all, this is really old precedent. It was decided before the passage of the Lanham Act. Justice Breyer in dissent says, well, wait a minute. We, we assume Congress meant to carry forward old common law rules unless they explicitly do something to the contrary. That principle comes up in cases that we're going to discuss later in this course. And so I'm going to hold on that argument for, for, for now. The court also says, though, that and things are maybe different in the tr in the domain name context or for a mark like booking.com, because there's only one possible holder of a domain name at a time. That's true, I suppose, but domain name registrations can lapse and other people may come along with similar sounding domain names, right? Booking.com, booking.net. Only one person can hold each of those at a time. It may both be held by booking.com, but someone may come along and want to re register a domain name that sounds awfully similar to booking.com and the existence of a trademark registration might preclude that ability. In addition, and this is kind of the, the main point I think the, the court relies on, is that as a, as a matter of a bottom line is that what should matter in these cases is consumer perception. Do consumers see booking.com as a trademark or do they see it as a generic term? And we should let the facts decide. Here in this case, booking.com came forward with a survey and we, the lower courts credited that, and we're not going to second, de second guess that conclusion now. And so the court's conclusions in this regard, I think, raise two very interesting trademark policy issues. Number one, the potential effect of, on competition for awarding a trademark as something that's near the border, at the very least we could say, of what is or is not a generic mark. And number two, 
some issues about what do we want to do in order to promote quality trademarks. And by quality trademarks, I mean ones that not only leave other competitors free to compete, but also do a good job of performing the trademark, the, the trademark function of identifying and distinguishing the source of goods rather than categories of goods in the case of generic terms. And so the court takes up the competition problem directly and they acknowledge the claim or the argument that Booking.com may also go after companies that have Booking in their name, but are providing different kinds of services, like you know, theaterbooking.com, airlinesbooking.com, or, or, or the like. And the court says, yeah, right, that is a potential issue. But you know what? That's an issue with any kind of descriptive mark that might get trademark protection. And, and courts should be able to handle, should be able to handle that issue. And this introduces another issue that we'll be discussing at some length in later lectures. And that is the potential hydraulic effects of certain moves within trademark doctrine. And so the court here is expressing confidence that we can handle generic dot coms as trademarks. The reason we can handle it is that we have other doctrines out there that can contain the potential damage of a mistake in handing out a generic dot com or a potential over assertion of a generic dot com. And number one is we have this fair use defense for descriptive uses of trademark terms. And number two, we uh, the plaintiff actually has to establish that there is a likelihood of confusion by the consuming public before it can assert a valid trademark claim. And so note that the court is making the assumption that these other doctrines are going to be adequate to the task and that there's nothing in particular about a generic dot com mark that is that has some potential for abuse or alternatively that we're just sure that courts are good at handling likelihood of confusion cases that are wrongfully asserted. And note that Justice Breyer points out in his dissent that we need to be cautious about the prospect that claims that are over asserted may deter others from entering into the field or may deter others from standing on their rights. And so if somebody has a trademark registration, the, C and D, the, the cease and desist letter that they send out that kind of brandishes, look, we get the registration on, on book, book, booking.com would, would have an interorum effect on a rational defendant. And that defendant may choose to not want to bear the cost of litigation even if, even if at the end of the day, they would have prevailed and convinced the court that there was in fact no likelihood of confusion for their, you know, for theaterbooking.com, notwithstanding the claim made by booking.com. A potential defendant may just decide it's just better off, better off not getting into this and not using, not using the mark, not using the domain name that they wanted to use. And insofar as that domain name may be helpful for consumers to find the service in question, that's a loss for the consuming public. Another issue though, we might ask is whether or not the game is worth the candle here. That is, even if we can say that, you know, booking.com is capable of performing trademark function, it's not a great mark. At the very least, it's a descriptive. And descriptive marks don't perform the trademark function as naturally as do marks on the other end of the spectrum of distinctiveness, or at least trademark law so assumes. And they're freighted with this market relevant meaning that other parties might want to use. And so we're kind of at the low quality end of the trademark spectrum. And so we have to ask, you know, is it worth it given how easy it is for booking.com to come up with a domain name or to come up with a trademark or, or, or a service mark in this case, is it worth having this fight? And is it worth the adjudication costs that are going to come with recognizing this kind of mark? Another issue that comes up is how much do we actually trust the survey in this case? And again, this is something pointed out by Justice Breyer, that maybe respondents are just recognizing that there is a booking.com out there or that they've heard of an entity offering services under that name. But that's true of any would-be mark that is generic, but nonetheless advertises. And this is a problem that's been identified in the case law that's sometimes referred to as de facto secondary meaning. Even though a mark may be generic, and therefore ineligible for protection, it's possible that some people actually do use the term to identify and distinguish goods and services 
in the marketplace. Nonetheless, the law says that the cost of allowing that kind of protection are just simply too high. And the party is then on the hook for coming up with a different mark if what they want to have is trademark protection. Because there are going to be other consumers who want to use the term in question not as a trademark, but rather as a category identifier. And other sellers who want to use the term as a category identifier. And the interests of those consumers and sellers outweigh the benefits that are conferred by protecting as a trademark a generic term. Another issue that Booking.com raises, and the court I don't think really addresses, is the issue of how is the PTO supposed to screen a mark like Booking.com if, in fact, that mark were generic? So let's assume that the survey is a bad one, or let's, let's assume that the survey doesn't show what it purports to show. What can the PTO do in that situation? They're, they're not in a position to hire experts to evaluate the survey. They're not in a position to commission a counter survey. And unless there's an opposition, there's kind of a mismatch of resources. So we might think about public choice dynamics. What happens when the benefits of a possible governmental action are concentrated on one entity, in this case, the would-be trademark holder, and the costs of the government action are diffuse among the public at large. And so let's assume arguendo that Booking.com is, in fact, a bad mark. It is, in fact, going to create costs in the marketplace by deterring other people from using domain names that are descriptive of booking services. And, you know, some, some of these companies aren't in existence yet, right? So it's not like they can go and file an opposition right now to something that Booking.com may not do for years to come. And yet the benefits of the registration, right? They're all concentrated on booking. And so booking.com has a strong incentive to do what it can to get this mark, you know, involved in including things like commissioning an expensive survey. And so this is, I think, a really interesting problem with the opinion. Sure, it's a fact question, but it's a fact question that is kind of hard to adjudicate in the abstract. And in order to get the evidence that we really might need to have a clean adjudication of whether or not the term has a primary significance that is generic to the consuming public at large is going to be quite expensive. And it's perfectly plausible, I think, for trademark law to look at this situation and say, yeah, we've got a kind of mark that at best is going to be pretty low quality. There's some potential for abuse. And there's no real need for there to be trademark, a trademark in this term, given the vast range of trademarks one might have. And indeed, if Booking.com used some other kind of, you know, arbitrary or fanciful name, they would still be free, still be free to register the Booking.com mark and to advertise, you know, look for Booking.com. Want, but want, want to. Want to book your next trip? You know, want, want to book, book your next hotel stay? Look no further than Booking.com, a service of Eagle Enterprises, or, or goodness knows what. That's not a hard thing for Booking.com to do. They don't want to do it because they think it's a, it's it's nice to have a trademark that actually is is the domain name, and it's you know good for them if if they can get it. But it's possible, nonetheless, for trademark law to make the judgment that says, in general, generic.com is a low quality kind of mark. It imposes potential costs. And so we are going to have a general presumption against those kinds of terms, thinking that it's just not worth it. And if there's some kind of special case, then special evidence has to be proffered to overcome that assumption. And and what the court is saying here is that we don't want shortcuts in this area. This is a fact question, and we're going to treat it like any other fact question, even though, even though, the potential incentives of the parties who are raising the factual claims are structured in a way as to favor the granting of marks at the border, given the mismatch of incentives between the PTO, which is hearing, you know, th- which, which receives thousands upon thousands of trademark applications, and examining attorneys who don't necessarily have the resources to really build a factual record that, say, and say another company that actually knows and has reason to engage in an opposition 
would against a, against a mark like Booking.com. But again, if the costs of a Booking.com mark really are diffuse and the benefits are concentrated, we wouldn't expect necessarily for that kind of evidence to appear. And the court is not really interested in that question in Booking.com. They just sort of assume this is just a fact claim like any other.